To Real Democracy Now. I'm Nevek Thompson and Real Democracy Now is a podcast for people who think we can and should improve how democracy works. This podcast looks at democracy from different angles to help you think about how democracy might be improved. Welcome to episode 13 in season 2 of Real Democracy Now, a podcast. In today's episode we're talking about the democratic deficit again, this time focusing more on structural aspects of democracy. First up, I talked to Professor Nadia Urbanati. Nadia is a professor of political theory and Hellenic studies at Columbia University. She is a political theorist who specializes in modern and contemporary political thought and the democratic and anti-democratic traditions. Nadia has written extensively on democracy, including the books Representative Democracy, Principles and Genealogy, Democracy Disfigured, and Mill on Democracy, From the Athenian Polis to Representative Government. I first spoke to Nadia in episode 2.2 of the podcast, where she spoke about the origins and components of representative democracy. Today, Nadia talks about the democratic deficit, as well as her book, Democracy Disfigured, where she identifies three types of democratic disfigurement, the unpolitical, the populist, and the plebiscitarian. There's a lot of talk around about a democratic deficit, problems with our current system of democracy, and one line of argument is that the design of representative democracy has a structural deficit built into it. And I think it, you know, in part goes to this, you know, different views on what is representation. But I just wondered what, what's your view on how democratic our current system of representative democracy really is? Representative democracy is uh, in its complexity in the permanent needs of monitoring and uh, adjustment. Because, for instance, what the exercise of representation requires money. Representation is also connected to a system of media, a system of uh, collection of ideas, uh, making possible electoral campaigns. This is a mechanism that requires a lot of money sometimes, more or less depends on the states, on each country. And so until now, we always identify this aspect with simply freedom as the United States where I live. My freedom express, my, express itself uh, by the fact that I give money to the representatives. Well, this may mean that those who have less possibility give less, those who have much more possibility give more, and that we don't know for sure whether those who give more and those who give less are equally listened to. Of course, we cannot prove that those who give more have a kind of special say on the lawmaking. There is no evidence of this causal relationship between giving money and having uh, f- uh, favorable laws. This is true. However, we cannot simply stay or uh, persist into this doubt and into this sense of uh, not equality in the ability we have to make our voice heard. So something needs to be done if we want to preserve our institutions, if we want to to go on thinking that representation and democracy can stay together and thus um, maintenance of our constitutions, the maintenance of our legal and rules needs to be um, needs to be conceived in terms of uh, public financing to political campaigns and parties. These are crucial money. Democracy needs to have its own money, public money to spend for itself Democracy is something that needs to be able to rely upon its own money without relying only and simply on the market, because the market is not necessarily a place of equal distribution of power and not necessarily a place of impartiality uh, when we come to decision making and politics. So if we think of democracy not simply as a empty shelf, but a way that uh, through which a citizen operates both in the civil society and in politics, as we said before, this diarchy, this needs to be uh, contemplated. Some countries are better than others in uh, 
providing for public money to, for elections and parties. Other issues, for instance, the question of voting and elections. Uh, I know that in Australia, the voting rights is in fact also a duty because you yes, are supposed to right. pay a fine if you don't go to vote, yep. right? So in other countries, uh, this is similar to your country. I think this is very good as a, not because we, we need to impose but certainly a sovereign who does not operate anymore, or like in the United States or elsewhere, we go to see the, the, the figures of uh, participation in electoral campaign and in the elections for the presidencies sometimes are even below the 50 percent, below the 40 percent. So we cannot afford that. We really can't. So I think that we, uh, something needs to be done uh, in these two uh, moments. Plus. The question of media. Now, here we would need to open a new huge chapter, and there is no time in this our conversation we have now. But just to uh, make clear that uh, we need uh, truly a protection of plurality of medias and pluralism of medias and not concentration of medias in private hands or uh, corporations. And also the public media needs to be ruled by or governed by an authority that is completely autonomous from political power and the majority of parliaments. So there are these important inter interventions to be done. And moreover, other things perhaps uh, needs to be conceived in terms of uh, accountability or relationship between our representatives and the parties and us. Should the uh, representatives, once they are in the uh, parliament, be completely free to change uh, parties? Until now they are. However, some limitation to this freedom may be needed, even uh, if we don't want to resort to uh, imperative mandate, because otherwise our right to be represented is completely empty of meaning. So. Some fixing things, some fixing moments, some fixing strategies are needed, at least at the minimum level. We don't go to talk about uh, equality in the social, because this is a dramatic moment also, because we have to ask ourselves uh, how much inequalities in uh, social and economic capabilities a democracy can afford to persist and resist through time, because until... Now, we didn't feel this problem strongly, but now in America it's clear, in, the, in Europe also, the level of poverty, of impoverishment of, of the citizens uh, is reaching very devastating, I would say, very worrisome levels uh, that are uh, uh, impossible even to think and to believe. Uh, people, citizens uh, who were not poor, who become poor, uh, or citizens who uh, are per perceive themselves as second-rate citizens, citizens who are in need of uh, uh, stamps uh, to go to buy something for in specific stores just for them, this is, listen, this is for me is a scandal because this is a way of presenting the citizens as made of uh, different layers, some of them more relevant than others. So this is a violation of basic equality of citizenship. In Democracy Disfigured, you identify three ways in which our current system of democracy is being undermined. Can you explain those to us and also touch on if there's anything we can do to reduce their impact? Well, this is a huge question, but I promise you to be very synthetic and, uh, and quick. First, the three questions. In my view, at least, the risks are may, uh, three, perhaps more, but in this case, uh, I work on these three. One, the relevant uh, role more and more of technocratic expertise, bureaucracies, the myth of regulations which also is connected to neoliberal uh, or privatization of services, which seems to be an expansion, not a containment of regulations and bureaucracy on the one hand, and thus the, the increase of, of the perception that competence is more and more relevant, not only where it should be, that is in the administration, but also in the policy, in, in those who are going to decide, making decisions. We are citizens. Most of us many of us, I'm sorry, incompetent, 
and yet we are not the right we don't have don't enjoy the right to vote because we are competent so this is for me is an important issue unfortunately it's growing as we saw this summer with the polemic uh, after brexit where many people said that pe- the ordinary citizens are incompetent to go to vote on many issues okay the second is populism populism you know it is a, the conversation of its own but it is an attempt of a part of a people to claim to be the people altogether no matter how many they are even a large majority cannot uh, take the state uh, in his own hands and operate in the name of the old people so populism is a kind of uh, limitation Uh, or actually, I'm sorry, disfigurement of uh, constitutional democracy, division of powers in particular, and the um, exaltation of the moment of decision by a leader. So the leader that embodies, incarnates uh, the people uh, in a twist uh, of leadership uh, and uh, quasi-dictatorial leadership, that is, for me, very problematic. The, the third one is a plebiscitarian conception of democracy, which is connected also to populism. It is also through the media and through the audience that we li- um, witness today, like in America and with the election of Trump, this idea that uh, the elections are simply the, not more elections, but they are a kind of acclamation of a leader. So in this case, we are disappearing through the leader and the leader makes us uh, simply appear as um, supporters for the moment of elections. Then what the leader does, what we can, uh, if we can control him, this is a very foggy issue because of course we would like to have this big eye controlling the the plebiscitary leaders but in fact the leaders in this plebiscitary system is capable of making us uh, see what he wants us to see so that is uh, in three brief uh, answers to your questions and so it seems to me that there's a potential tension between that concept of competence uh, and the need for competence, and and the growth of populism. Do you think they're a reaction to each other? They are. Uh, they are in a strange uh, relationship sometimes because you know many populists. Uh, I'm referring to the ones I know here in Europe, in particular. They make a claim uh, that is not necessarily against the technocratic government. Why? They make the claim against partisanship, against the pluriparties. They are against the assault that parties made um, to the state. And in the name of an objective uh, governance, uh, without uh, partisan implications, they reclaim uh, the uh, univocal uh, notion of the good government uh, in the name of the nation or the people as one. Not only, but they are ready to admit uh, that uh, they uh, want to rule the government uh, as uh, good administrators uh, in the name of the people. So the two are not necessarily in contradistinction or in contradiction. Uh, the Five Stars movement uh, in Italy has both a populistic tra- drive and the anti-party drive in the name of uh, Good, objective, uh, neutral ob- administration with, uh, with the you know, right competent people where they should be and uh, non-party, a non-party movement. So uh, I would say that uh, the two may go together instead of being enemies. Yes, that, that reminds me, I was speaking to uh, Professor Jerry Stoker recently about this concept of stealth democracy and how uh, yeah. the research he's done suggests that people uh, want politicians to get on with the job. They say, we know, we all know what needs to be done. Just get on and do it. And I can see how that I can see the relationship between competence and populism there in that there's a lot of people. They assume that the politicians are going to have the same view as them about what needs to be done. And they just want them to get on and do it. Yes, yes. This is a very good point. Also because it's a specific character of populism is the uniformity or unity of the entire people without uh, internal divisions, uh, ideologically speaking divisions. So 
the more parties you have, the more ideological diversification you have, the more you uh, are not competent in the sense of objective competent to rule the uh, the government. Yes, that's Populism has this uh, this uh, anti-party anti-party uh, approach to politics and the assumption that politics is an issue of administration, like uh, you know the leader or the administrators uh, in a co- in a corporation uh, do the right thing as if in politics there were the right thing to do. Of course, there is the right thing to do in the bureaucracy. When uh, you know you uh, you have uh, public officers, they have to do their specific job. But bureaucracy is not the political domain we are talking about when we speak about um, representative democracy. We are talking about making laws, making decisions that holds for everybody. So this illusion that is possible to have good administrators and to have the will of the people ruling through them is a little bit frightening in my view. My second guest is Emeritus Professor Barry Hindus. Barry is Emeritus Professor in the School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University. Like many senior academics, he has published more than he cares to remember, including Discourses of Power from Hobbes to Foucault, Governing Australia, Studies in Contemporary Rationalities of Government, Corruption and Democracy in Australia, Us and Them, Elites and Anti-Elitism in Australia, and Papers on Neoliberalism, Liberalism and Empire. I came across Barry's 2002 paper, Deficit by Design, early in my PhD studies, and it was my introduction to the idea that the structure of representative democracy was itself one of the key limitations for the system of democracy. Barry's argument is that the problem of the democratic deficit is in fact the normal condition of the institution of representative democracy, concluding that the democratic deficit is an integral part of its design. Barry is now retired, so I'm very grateful that he made the time to talk with me for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me today, Barry. Your work suggests that representative democracy is not using the term democracy in the original sense of the word. Can you explain your perspective on these two terms or concepts? Marguerite, that over the last 400 years or so in the West, the term democracy has changed its meaning used to mean ruled by the people directly. And that was generally regarded as a bad thing. And then um, during the 19th century, turned to Oxford came to be used to refer to a representative government, which is not ruled by the people, but ruled by representatives elected by the people. That's how the term is now used, to refer to government by elected politicians. And um, the reason that's not simply ruled by elected people is that um, actually we're ruled by um, elected officials and by unelected officials, public servants. It's not governed by, ele- by representatives, it's governed by representatives and public servants. Many people talk about the democratic deficit and they refer to declining levels of trust and political corruption, amongst other things, as being the root cause. Uh, You take a slightly different perspective. Can you tell us about how you conceptualise the democratic deficit? I think the deficit is built into the system. Now, a system of, as I say, government by representatives and public servants. The um, representatives are supposed to reflect the views of the people who relate them, but they don't. We know that. So the deficit comes in the difference between the representatives and public servants and the people who relate the representatives. That seems to be built into our system of government. One reason why trust in government declines over time is that um, after major events like wars or um, revolutions, as in Eastern Europe, then people have a whole thing done a new system of government for a time. And you have to get used to it and things wrong with it, and it becomes increasingly cynical over time. Based on your view that the democratic deficit is built into the design of representative democracy, how might we go about minimising or eliminating this uh, democratic deficit? Well, it depends on who you mean by who your we is. (laughs) Yes, yes. Someone who actually had the authority to make a change. Mm, It's asking a lot of politicians too much about that. Ah, yes. From your perspective, are there any particular institutional changes that would make a difference? 
at the moment, I think um, in Australia we have rampant inequality. And doing something seriously to minimise that would make a difference. Whatever government brought that in would be less popular in some quarters and more popular than others. I think major attacking inequality would do a lot to change things. Yeah, that's a recurring theme that's come through, Barry, and a lot of the people I've spoken to. My third guest is Professor Wolfgang Merkel, who is the Director of the Research Unit, Democracy and Democratisation, at the WZB Social Science Research Centre in Berlin, as well as heading up the Centre for Global Constitutionalism and a number of other projects. He has written widely on democracy, democratisation, social democracy and democracy and capitalism, to name but a few. Professor Merkel is also co-project leader of the Democracy Barometer. I spoke to him about the Democracy Barometer in episode 2.3. What do you think are the challenges facing representative democracy at the moment? Oh, there are quite a few, and this is uh, what uh, one could uh, formulate the following way. What we have seen in the last quarter of the 20th century was a triumph and of transitions from authoritarian rule to democratic regimes. There was a real and powerful third wave, which stopped more or less at the year uh, 2000. Uh, But at the same time, when many of the Asian, African, uh, and especially Latin American dictatorships became somehow, I have to say, somehow uh, democratic, the Malays, and uh, the uneasiness and the feeling that the regimes are not probably working in the democratic world of Europe or North America or New Zealand and Australia became stronger and stronger. Meaning there is a visible and strong disenchantment with democracy. That democracy, this is so to say the complaint Democracy does not deliver to a large extent what it promises. And I can give you some points on that. Uh, These are well known, uh, but uh, uh, maybe it is somehow didactically uh, worthwhile uh, to repeat it from time to time. The first one is parliament, political parties and elected governments. They are the institutional core of representative democracy and they are losing trust among citizens. Citizens do not believe very much into the legitimacy of these concrete parties, parliaments and governments. They do not lose uh, trust in the idea of democracy, but they claim that these parliaments and parties do not work properly uh, according to the democratic promises. And it's always a risky period if people do not believe in these concrete institutions. This is one point, and I say in in a minute, I say something why this might be the case. The second one is what we have seen during the last three decades is simply uh, that uh, the developed democratic countries have deregulated markets on a global scale, especially financial markets. Deregulation here means that they uh, let the markets out of the control of democratic elected government. These markets became so powerful that it is almost impossible to re-regulate them on a global scale, meaning that uh, they will regulate it in the UK and Australia, in uh, the United States of America and Germany, for example, because there are different ideas to which degree they should be deregulated. One can say in a nice or in a, maybe it's not so nice, in a democratic paradox, these governments, starting with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, disempower themselves, disempower democracy by giving too much power to the markets, which are 
not very strictly regulated by uh, democratic elected uh, governments. And this restricts to a large extent the possibility of democratic governments to steer the economy, to uh, look for a common good, and not only uh, trust into the uh, efficiency of markets. On the other hand, uh, if you have elections, parties have to promise something to the people, and they promise more than they actually can fulfill. This is not that they are simply bad governments. It has something to do with the specific uh, way a globalization has occurred during the last three decades, if you want uh, to have a catchy word, this neoliberal type of globalization. There is another point I would like to mention if we are talking about the malaises of representative democracy, and this is the internationalization on the one side and the denationalization of nation state politics on the other side. Here I want to say nation states are not uh, that old as we know. They are uh, 300 years, basically. Uh, some are a bit older, some are even less older. The German nation state emerged only as a state in 1871, for example. So they are not that old. But what we are now witnessing is that uh, nation states cannot deal on uh, any longer with specific political problems because these problems transcend nation state borders. And if we talk about the environmental protection, if we talk about climate change, if we talk about peacekeeping, if we talk about trade, then uh, you have clearly problems which cannot be solved simply by, an, uh, by any, even not the United States, single nation state. They need cooperation. And sometimes they create supranational regimes like the European Un Union, meaning supranational that decisions are no longer taken on the nation state, they are taken on the state of the European Union. And here you have 28 uh, states which are participating in these institutional decisions. And at the end, if one is not completely out of reality, uh, then one has to say uh, these supranational regimes cannot be democratized like, let's say, small cities or even a nation state. They uh, have less participation, they have less control, they, they, there's less accountability. Each time, if we defer national sovereignty rights to a supranational governing border, like the European Union or like the World Trade Organization, we may lose some degree of democracy. We may argue uh, this is necessary, otherwise we cannot fight, for example, climate change, and therefore we pay the price. But we should be open to say it and not to, uh, to spread this illusion, everything can be democratized, we only have to want it. So this is certainly a wide array of problems a representative democracy is facing at present, I should add a last one, which is troubling for most of the democracies on both sides of the Atlantic. Obviously, not so much in New Zealand and Australia, but in Western, Eastern Europe and the US. This is right-wing populism. And this is a dubious movement, or these are dubious parties, which I would call not completely anti-democratic, but they are semi-democratic. And they want to cut back liberal rights, liberal rights we are very proud of in our democracies, because we could install them in the, during the last 30 years. Clearly, gender equality, there is something to do, but the idea is something 
uh, we thought is without any challenge anymore, uh, but it is challenge. But then you have gay rights, you have ethnic minority rights, you have um, a guarantee right uh, for multi-religious competencies and institutions in our societies. And here right-wing populism will reduce these specific liberal rights, will certainly close borders, and has in the background a kind of ethnically motivated, exclusive concept what a nation uh, should be. And this is something democracy is struggling very hard and right-wing uh, populism, populist parties are uh, increasingly powerful in Eastern and Western Europe. And one, uh, even Donald Trump is probably more uh, a big, big, big ego and a an, uh, power opportunist, but the way he is now governing and the way he uh, launched his electoral campaigns clearly show that there is a receptive ground among the citizens for these illiberal populist appeals. A very long answer, but uh, this is uh, the challenges are uh, quite considerable uh, democracy is facing now. My fourth guest is Professor Leonardo Molino, who is a professor of political science and director of the Research Center on Democracies and Democratization at LUISS Rome. Professor Molino is a leading specialist in comparative politics with expertise on Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and the phenomenon of democratization. Professor Molino was also part of episode 2.3, explaining his analytical approach to evaluating democracy. I know some writers specifically relate the democratic deficit to, to the design of the current system of representative democracy. What's your thinking on that and how does your uh, analytical tool address those issues? My analytical tool is limited on these issues as is limited at the, at this, the invention of democracy. As I said, democracy is a collective invention of the mankind that no one was looking at. We could say that democracy as such is a, a sort of a side consequence, more than really a, an invention that everyone would like, uh, would like to, to have. Mm. Uh, if we, we consider, for example, the great movements the great actors, say, of the 19th centuries, uh, uh, the socialist uh, politicians, uh, the socialist leaders, uh, the socialist ideology was looking for, for other aspects. Uh, the communist ideology was looking for uh, other kind of regime. Uh, the liberal democracy, the liberal, the liberal ideology was looking for other kind of regime. So what we now call democracy, and actually is a mass liberal democracy in a more explicit way mm. is a, a result, uh, an invention that no one was looking for. It's a, a sort of intermediate result uh, out of different, uh, different goals. This, uh, this result has many limitations, many problems. No doubt, the short term, uh, as you have mentioned, the possibility of success of populism that you have mentioned uh, are all of them. But we were not able to do better. It's, it, again, as simple as that. We were not able, as mankind, to do better. Maybe with the technology, we can improve some aspect of democracy, but we will see, because we are realizing that technology, information, computer, digital development uh, uh, created a set of opportunities but within this set of opportunities, this range of opportunities, there was also the, the range for some negative aspect, such as an authoritarian development within the, the new uh, protest party that developed in, in Southern Europe, for example, from the Podemos in Spain to Faisal movements in Italy to, to Syriza in Greece, where there was room, uh, again, of course, for protest, and this is a, a positive aspect 
uh, of, of democracy, for expression of discontent, of dissatisfaction, but also room for uh, authoritarian position with uh, strong authoritarian leaders uh, that were conditioning the vote uh, of a lot of people. So again, this is uh, a sort of uh, a, a path that we are doing, uh, and w w we think, we hope that we will learn from our mistakes, as usual. My fifth guest is Dr. Rosalind Fuller, a Canadian-Irish academic and columnist specialising in public international law and the impact of technological innovation on democracy. Her latest book, Beasts and Gods, How Democracy Changed Its Meaning and Lost Its Purpose, explores the flaws of representative democracy and how they could be addressed through the ancient Athenian principles of democratia, people power. She is currently a research associate at the Waterford Institute of Technology. Rosalind was also my guest in episode 2.2, talking about her research on democracy in ancient Athens and how we might apply Athenian direct democracy today. Like Nadia Urbanati, Rosalind is concerned about the impact of money on democracy. So many people talk about the democratic deficit and they refer to things like declining levels of trust, political corruption as being at the root of that, that democratic deficit. In my reading of your book, you, you focus more on structural limitations as being at the core of the democratic deficit. Can you explain your thinking around this? Yeah, well, we have to ask ourselves, you know, if we have political corruption, why do we have that? Why doesn't our system take care of that or hold it uh, within very low limits? So I looked at how does the structure of our political system work. And what I noticed is that elections create a kind of bottleneck in time. It doesn't matter what people think a day before an election. It doesn't matter what people think a day after an election. It only matters what they think at the exact time of the election. So it makes sense to focus all of your resources on winning an election. And winning an election is not about winning votes. Winning an election is about winning seats. And you can, if you, if you manage your resources carefully, you can translate a relatively small number of votes into a very large number of seats. So what elections encourage is for people to focus resources on a really narrow gap in time to, kind of, to try to game the system to maximize their vote to seat ratio. And that takes quite a lot of money uh, to make that happen. You can see quite clearly the more money a candidate or party spends on an election, the more likely they are to win. It doesn't work in every case, but it works in most cases. So over time, you see that money equals political power. And then, of course, you can use that power to get more money, because at that point, you have to say, OK, who helped me win an election? Who contributed to my success at the polls? And you have to pay them back. Or you might even not feel that level of loyalty to them, but you might think to yourself, well, you know, I'm, I'm friends with these people or entities, corporations, you know, we feel closely aligned to them. It would only make sense for us to pass laws that are important to them. So, for example, you know, loosening up labor laws or, um, you know, trade agreements. Those things might be very unpopular with the general population, but they are popular with the people who are going to help you win power and stay in power. So over time, what you have is wealth, equally political power, being used to acquire more wealth, being used to get more power, to get wealth, to get power, to get wealth, to get power. And gradually, this excludes more and more people from uh, the decision making process as they cannot keep up uh, with the levels of wealth that are required to really play this game. And it also uh, makes it very, very hard for small parties to overcome those barriers and uh, truly be a force in politics instead of just, you know, a fringe entities that win a couple of seats but don't have any impact on policy. So, yeah, I think that that is definitely something that differentiates me from uh, a lot of other uh, commentary on this issue. If you have a situation that concentrates wealth and power in a few hands, well, of course, you're going to get corruption. Of course, you're going to get cheating. Of course, the stakes are going to become ever higher in this competition. That's what's behind all of the problems that we are experiencing, because you would be crazy if you're a politician. You would be crazy not to engage in this kind of behavior, because if you don't, 
your chances of winning are extremely low. And if you don't win, of course, you can't do anything. You can't undertake anything at all. So people justify to themselves why they're engaging in this behavior. They say, well, if I don't win power, I can't make any decisions. I can't do anything. Uh, even, you know, all of the things I have to, um, you know, all of the plans I have that I think would be uh, beneficial for society. Um, if you're a company, it would be crazy for you not to seek to influence politicians, because of course, they're going to make decisions that are going to have a serious impact on your future as a company. So this very system incentivizes people to sail very, very close to the wind and always be pushing the envelope. Because if you won't, someone else will. And then they'll be in power and you'll be excluded. And finally, we hear from Associate Professor Ben Isakhan, who is Associate Professor of Politics and Policy Studies and Founding Director of POLIS, a research network for politics and international relations in the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University. He is also Adjunct Senior Research Associate in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg and an Associate of the Sydney Democracy Network. Ben is the author of Democracy in Iraq, History, Politics, Discourse, and the editor of six books including The Secret History of Democracy, The Edinburgh Companion to the the History of Democracy, From Prehistory to Future Possibilities. He was a guest on episode 2.4, talking about non-Western democracy. Today he talks about the challenges to brand democracy. That the brand of democracy is not doing very well. And, you know, th- this is a whole heap of different things are converging in the late, well, the early 21st century. Um, one of them is um, the Bush administration and their interventions built atop the idea of bringing democracy to Iraq and Afghanistan. That created a great deal of cynicism globally about democracy, uh, bringing democracy by war, and then the fact that it was an abject failure in both contexts, um, and that both states remain, you know, terribly behind on any significant index. I think that that created that was the the the, the sort of first step in the early 21st century that really began uh, the process of a deep cynicism globally about democracy and its ability to 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 do good governance and that that cynicism is getting way worse. It's gotten out of control now. Um, People are very frank about uh, being dismissive of democracy as a form of government. I mean, you have have now all across, I mean, you have uh, many other things I can point to. Think of things like the Arab Spring. You know, it's great for Saudi Arabia as just one example. Saudi Arabia can look back at the Arab Spring and say, say to their citizens, don't ask us for democracy, otherwise we'll end up like Libya or Syria. You know, the brand of democracy has lost a lot of its shine because, uh, in fact, if any, it's not just lost its shine, but it's, we're now at a point where autocratic, horrible, autocratic, oppressive regimes are able to say to their people, democracy is bad. Look what it's done in Look what calls for democracy have achieved in Syria and Libya and so on. Look what it achieved when they went into Iraq. Look what it's achieved here and there and there. And then you put on top of that things like Brexit and Trump, the most recent developments in kind of proliferating a broader cynicism about democracy. And, you know, people are extremely uh, critical and cynical about it now. And with good reason. These two things, you know, 2016 will go down historically for a, as a pretty rough year for democracy and the extent to which democracy, the brand of democracy globally is going to suffer as a product of that, I think is enormous. We'll be feeling the ramifications for years. Um, just something like Trump, it's a great, it's a great example. China has been, has been very forthright. Don't ask us for democracy because this is what happens. You get demagogues who use populist rhetoric to, to manipulate and lie to people in order to get power. Uh, and that's what's happened. And so it's a credible story. But China is able to use it in order to maintain a one-party authoritarian, well, quasi-authoritarian state. So, you know, the brand, I think, is in real trouble. And it's even in trouble in, in Western democracies. It's certainly in trouble here. People are deeply cynical about democracy in Australia, uh, but probably not on, not on even a fraction of the scale as they are in Europe, uh, in the UK, in the US and elsewhere. There's a trend now towards strong leadership. And I think in certain quarters, people like Trump and Putin um, are being applauded uh, for their anti-democratic ideals. So I think the brand's in real trouble. I think that 
that really matters to me. Thanks for joining me today. In the next episode of Real Democracy Now!, a podcast, I will be talking to Quinton Main, who is an Associate Professor of Public Policy in the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. I'll be talking to Quinton about his research on satisfaction with democracy, which has uncovered some interesting factors which impact on people's levels of satisfaction. I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for listening to Real Democracy Now! You can find more about today's topic in the show notes at www.realdemocracynow.com.au. If you enjoyed this program, please subscribe to this podcast, write a review, share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation on the webpage or on Facebook or Twitter. I'd love to know what you think is the essence of a real democracy.